Now comes 1710. Now when 1710 came, here's the main point of my talk today. 1710 did something that is totally devastating. Totally devastating. The Virginia colony in 17 passed what they call meritorious manumission. Meritorious manumission says, what we're gonna do now that we put up the external controls in 1705, we must have internal controls. We don't have the time to go around and monitor and watch all these black folk coming into this country. We must build in some kind of inter internal management control. We must build in a way like the Rodney King syndrome, that kind of thing. And we must build into black folk an inappropriate behavior pattern. We must teach black folk to see things upside down in a non-realistic manner. 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 Meritorious manumission came in effect in 1710 and says, we will pay, I mean, we will reward, we will recognize, we will set free. Any black person does one of four things. One, if you in fact will save a white person's life. I told you about the young man with the, on the boat with the eagle, there were five, six years before that. If you save a white person's life, you will get your freedom. Two, if you protect a white person's property. Three, if you invent something that a white person can make wealth and power off of, some kind of an invention. And four, if you in fact will squeal on, inform on, or tell on your own people. That was called meritorious manumission. Wait, that don't sound right. Just wait one second, that don't sound right. That don't sound right. I want to show how much emphasis Pastor Majors put on Professor Bunis's purported confirmation during that uh, Boom Church panel discussion back on November 22nd. Then I want to share a few more clarifications which Professor Bunis has put forth via email. So here I'm going to show a couple minutes of footage from the Boom Church panel discussion, which, as I said, took place on Sunday, November 22nd. Uh, note in particular, as you watch this, note how Pastor Majors asserts that Professor Bunis confirmed Beniah Israel's interpretation of the markings. Note how Pastor Majors says Professor Bunis backs the sentence that he presented. Note how he insinuates that it is this scholar who enables him to say what is on the pew. And note the way he treats this as practically a mic drop of a moment. Mic drop of a moment. Mic drop of a moment. And this is an email which was sent directly to me by Professor Bunis, and it reads as follows, quote, Dear Mr. Alman Hatani, or Abdel Messi, thanks for your email. I'm sorry it took a while for me to reply. Basically, I confirm your understanding of my correspondence with William Brown. As I had written him in the beginning, the letters looked more Arabic than Hebrew to me, but I'm certainly no authority in Arabic paleography. Before writing you, I spoke with someone very familiar with the various Arabic and Hebrew scripts, and he was unable to read any Arabic, or frankly Hebrew, words out of the church pew inscriptions. When someone who had uh, looked at the inscription showed us how he thought the Hebrew word for Israel or Yisrael might be read out of it, it looked to me like it might possibly be so, although I could not see this clearly without the markings and darkenings that he evidently added. <laughs> Okay, in this next portion here, this is him quoting a portion of the email that I had sent to him. So he's quoting me here. To your questions, did you in fact reach a firm conclusion that a discernible Hebrew phrase is on the relevant pew? Or did you merely suggest possible interpretations of a collection of markings open to multiple interpretations? And did you support a reading that could be translated, take grasp of the Lord, etc.? If so, can you share what the precise Hebrew phrase was, which was translated that way? And now here's his reply. My reply is, no, I definitely did not reach a firm conclusion to the effect. And yes, I think that at most, the markings are open to multiple interpretations. I certainly cannot make any connection between the English phrase you cited and any Hebrew expression I can think of. I can think of. I can think of. I can think of. Interesting turn of events with Professor Bunis. Let's visit some of the email traffic between the participants. Let's start with the final response Professor Bunis sent to Pastor William Brown. He says, Hi William, 
The aftermath of our correspondence is a bit amazing to me. It really shows just how much interest there is in this inscription and how people with all kinds of agendas seem to be trying to use what they read out of the inscriptions to their own advantage. That was not the sense I got when I first read your original email. But if possible, please don't continue to cite me as a supporting source because I really have no definite idea what the inscription says or in which, if any, alphabet is written. I hope you're not offended by this request. Best wishes from Jerusalem, David. What caused the sudden shift with Professor David Bunis? What was said or written in the emails he received? What's the agenda? This is the apology Pastor William Brown sent to Professor Bunis. It says, I nor any of my family is linked to any radical Hebrew Israelite groups, nor did I nor my family intend to cause a firestorm of misrepresentations on Professor David Bunis' part. The point of sending the pews to Professor Bunis was to identify if it was Hebrew because of my family history and culture of the First African Baptist Church. Many are using my video to get clarity regarding the pews as a means to promote their ideology. I apologize, Professor David Bunis. If this has gotten out of hand and it was not intended to involve you on this level, now, I believe there's an agenda to discredit the writings on the pews entirely by loading your email up with emails about Hebrew Israelites that have nothing to do with me. I apologize if this has offended you, Pastor William Brown. So who is this person Pastor William Brown is addressing in the first sentence of his apology? This person goes by the name of Joseph Patterson. Initially, I thought this was one of the many dummy accounts the urban apologetic community are known to create for the purpose to hide behind. They use dummy accounts to boost their subscribers and attack others. What's sad and alarming about this individual, he is an educator. He is a youth pastor in his local assembly. He is actually a leader. Now, pay attention to the deceptive email he sent to the professor. I want you to pay attention to the red flags. It says, Good evening, Dr. Bunis. I am Joseph Patterson, and I am an educator at a local high school in Virginia. And I have a few of my former students who identify with such groups as the moderate Hebrew Israelites, who has used your name and credentials to deduce that since Hebrew language was written on the pews by black slaves, Therefore, blacks who came by way of the transatlantic slave trade are the true Jews. Well, I figured, now notice the buzzword, moderate Hebrew Israelites. Notice how he strategically used the phrase true Jews with the words Jews in caps. All who understand email etiquettes in a professional workplace know that you are not supposed to type words or sentences in capital letters because this means that the person is yelling or raising their voice. This email had nothing to do with a desire for truth, but a desire to intimidate and discourage this professor. Little did this person realize that the professor included Pastor Majors in the email thread. What's also alarming is how this professor handled this situation. Little did Pastor William Brown know that the professor allegedly sent a copy of the email to Abu. He sent what is called BCC, which stands for Blind Courtesy Copy. Why would this professor handle this situation in this manner? The email goes on to say, I will reach out to you directly. As far as you were concerned, the presenters used your commentary 
and scholarship as their source and authority to conclude that there was one word that could possibly been written in Hebrew and that script was solatrio. If you could please provide clarity on this subject, I would greatly appreciate it. Namely, did you conclude that the script was solatrio? Thank you so much. Again, there is so many red flags in this email thread. Why did this person feel the need to inject bias, deceptive racial constructs such as moderate Hebrew Israelites into his email? Why did this person deceptively inject the anti-Semitism tone to his thread? The term moderate Hebrew Israelite is a phrase Calvinist Bishop Eric Mason and Calvinist Damon Richardson created. It is a dead giveaway and has the urban apologetic community fingerprints all over it. What's interesting is the moderate label was used to draw a distinction of certain groups within Calvinism. This is coming from the Moody Handbook of Theology by Paul P. Enns, and it says, the doctrine of limited atonement may well be the most controversial point of Calvinism. Some Calvinists accept it, while moderate ones either categorically reject it or modify it. Many moderates say that Christ actually died only for the elect, but potentially died for all. Strict Calvinists insist that limited atonement is a logical necessity in view of God's sovereignty. This is the response Professor Bunis sent to Joseph Patterson and sent a blind copy to Pastor William Brown. Dear Mr. Patterson, thank you for your email. When I expressed a few hesitant words about what was written on the church pews, I had no idea it would help cause such furor, locally and maybe beyond. When I first saw the inscription, I thought it might be Arabic script. Then after seeing some interpretations by others, it seemed to me that one might be able to read the Hebrew word Yisrael that is Israel in it. I am far from sure about this, nor do I think that what seems to be some kind of inscription on the pews is solatrio script or is necessarily in Hebrew at all. Judging from the reactions I've been receiving, my words were rather misrepresented on William Brown's program. Only part of our email correspondence was presented, and even that seemed to have been partly misinterpreted. 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 Wait, that don't sound right. Just wait one second. That don't sound right. That don't sound right. an email from Professor Dr. Richard Katz in Tel Aviv regarding the views. And so there was a reference given by the first professor that he was sharp in the area of Solitreo, Ladino, Judaismo, but he was not sharp in the area of cursive Hebrew or any ancient languages as far as dealing with the Hebrew script or, in, or Aramaic or Arabic, anything like that. So he suggested to me in our first initial email, he suggested to me to reach out to and find a holographer of ancient Hebrew cursive. And so that was something that I did. I took his advice on that. And so while waiting on him to respond in the process of things, I was also emailing other professors and doctors and, and linguists in these areas just to make sure we cover all bases. And I thank him for giving me a reference to search out and, and try to get some understanding while we were waiting on his response. Got an email from Richard Katz. And so I sent him a picture of the pews. Again, like I always do, I've sent all of them email of the pews. But what I did this time that I didn't do last time, the last time I sent the email in a package of all of the pictures. But this time I make sure I sent individual ones based on our correspondence with each email. So that way I'm assuring that they are looking at embedding one pew, you know, we just want to make sure that we're covering all bases. The great thing about Richard Katz is not only that he's sharp in the area of cursive Hebrew and the philographer, but he has some understanding of the Solitario script. So here's the first email that we got back. 
So it says here, greetings, Professor Dr. Richard Cash. My name is William Brown. There's a church in Savannah, Georgia, which is now a historic landmark. And that used to teach Hebrew cursive was on the pews, but then changed it to Arabic. What I did was, in the first initial email with the first professor, I gave personal relation to it. So it says right here, landmark and that used to teach because of Hebrew was on the pews, but then changed it to Arabic. Can you verify if it's Arabic or Hebrew on the pew? So I sent him one pew. And then I said, I've attached one pew, but also have others. I also was told it could be Solidrail or Sephardic language. Thanks. His response. Thanks for emailing me, William. Looking at this pew, because I sent him one, I can definitively, now this is something that's very important because we want to make sure that there is a definitive statement. We don't want to make sure, we don't want to have anything smoking mirrors or anything like that. But it says, I can definitively say that it's not Arabic. 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 <laughs> but more closely to ancient Aramaic square letters, but could possibly be a form of Hebrew. Why? Because if you know the, the relation between Aramaic and Hebrew, you can see why he came to this conclusion. If you could email me more pictures of the pews, if you have them in a higher resolution, and I can give you a more definitive answer. Shalom. So the definitive answer is based upon Hebrew. He already gave a definitive answer that it's not Arabic. Okay? So, it's important. So I send him some more pews. I send him, thanks for these photos, William. I must say, looking at these photos, the old cursive handwriting of Judeo-Spanish language seems quite clear. Quite clear. Also, there are other characters on the pews. If I send him more than one pew. Remember, in the first email, I sent him one pew. The second one, I sent him more than one pew. There are other characters on the pews of cursive Hebrew used in Israel today. By the look of the writings, the pews could not have been written by the same person. That's possibly why Solitreo and Hebrew block letters, or some could interpret them as cursive, appear on them. The bottom left corner, here it is, listen to what it says. The bottom left corner, I would say, are Hebrew cursive letters. Hebrew cursive letters. Hebrew cursive letters. Hebrew cursive letters. In the traditional Bet Yod Nun Sophi, which would be the word Ben, B N, or Hebrew for son of. I hope this helped you on your quest. I'm interested in how the markings were written, especially since it's not a synagogue. Professor Richard Katz, Hebrew Linguistic Studies, Tel Aviv, Israel. I responded back to him. Thanks for your response, Professor. I've attached a picture and some drawings of the characters on the pews, if that helps. Looking forward to hearing from you if you aren't busy with school, but I truly appreciate you even looking at the pews. That was that email. Last one here. Okay. It says, Good morning, William. Regarding your last question, as I stated, Bet your Nun Sophie can be seen using Hebrew square letters and after reviewing what Benea presented, this is Soda Trail, because we know that Benea has been working on Soda Trail. He's already been given his answers regarding cursive Hebrew or even possibly Aramaic, depending on the connection, but he's given his definitive uh, response regarding cursive Hebrew. But listen to what he says here, or, or square Hebrew. This is what he says here. But they are presenting using Soda Trail. Those markings are extremely close. And one could conclude the words he translated from those markings are strikingly close in comparison. Why is that? Because I want to make sure 
that there's no wiggle room when it comes to even the work Benea has put in. So I want to get ver I want this professor to verify that what Benea is presenting is solar trail or if it's not. The thing is, he could simply say, okay, I see it, but it's not. He could be vague about it, but we're not going to play those games again. We're going to make sure we get definitive statements. Look what he says here. My conclusion regarding the pews, the words B'nai Yisrael, or son of Yisrael, or simply Yisrael, should be noted, 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 noted. From what I see after examining what you sent. Professor Richard Katz, Hebrew Linguistic Studies, Tel Aviv, Israel. Seventeen oh four, there's a black kid, there are a whole bunch of slaves coming in from Africa on a, on a on a slave vessel called the Eagle. The Eagle is heading towards America. There's a young black boy on there. Along with some other, with, along some other uh, older slaves, the slaves decide to revolt on the ship, and they took over and knocked the captain down, took over the ship, and took the weapons, and we're going to try and we're in a fight to take over the control of the ship and headed towards uh, back towards Africa. And as one of the older slaves grabbed a, a machete, and he said they're going to kill the captain so they can completely have control of the ship, as he swung at the captain. A young black slave jumped up and got in the way and protected the captain and took the blows himself, which chopped off one of his arms and protected the captain. And by protecting the captain, the captain was able to recover the control of the vessel, put all put down the, the, the insurrection, and it then hung all the blacks who were trying to revolt, except the young black kid who was only 19. When the captain got to America, he gave him to uh, supposedly a benevolent slave owner and rewarded him with recognition and says that after he's been, been educated and recovered from his wounds, that he's to be set free. And again, this young boy, he placed more importance on protecting other people than getting his free people out of a dilemma. Wait, down soon, right? Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. After the latest incident, which I am going to reveal shortly, I decided to do a little more research on Joseph Patterson. You know the guy earlier I mentioned who contacted Professor Bunis? I could not get over the moderate Hebrew Israelite comments in his initial email sent to the professor. This phrase was created by Bishop Eric Mason, who is the founder of Epiphany Fellowship located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He is also the founder of the woke church movement among the evangelicals. He came up with this byword, moderate Hebrew Israelites, along with Damon Richardson. I was able to confirm a few things about Joseph Patterson. I was able to confirm his connection to the nonprofit organization Unity with the Community. I was able to confirm his military record and other information about him. Now, before I go on, I want to make this clear. Please do not make any attempts to make contact with this individual. Do not make any attempts to contact his place of employment. This is why I chose not to post any potential contact information about this guy. We have to carry ourselves well above the disgraceful behavior of this person along with the urban apologetic community. I was able to locate his Facebook page in an attempt to confirm a possible connection to the urban apologetic community. Unfortunately, his friends list is hidden. However, the like section has more than enough information to confirm his connection. Under the like section of his Facebook profile, I was able to confirm his connection to Dr. Eric Mason. I'm vocab from your experience. What is it? And, 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 and kind of because there, I, I look through the feed. There's a lot of new people in here that are that are they're just trying. They're just starting to get their 
mind wrapped around like they just they just they just heard somebody was a Hebrew Israelite in their family. They don't even know what that is, what that means. So if we can help people out to kind of get their minds around it, definition wise, that'll be dope. Hey, brother George. Oh, hey. Um. <clears throat> well, obviously, me having a personal experience from uh, Hebrew Israelism, it's. Um, I guess it's, uh, how can I say? Pastor Isaiah Robertson. Um, and so when I see a Hebrew Israelite, right, go to the oldest existing black church in the nation uh, and make assertions. No, and no then, you, well, hold on. What, can you say what you're talking about, though? Yeah, yeah, what, what's, yeah. what's the name? Well, just tell, what's the name of the church you're talking about and where is it? First African Mm -hmm. Baptist in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, 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 that they knew that they were African. If they mm -hmm. thought that they were Hebrew, they would have never uh, embraced an African identity. African identity. African identity. African identity. I wish I was a little bit taller, 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 taller. I was also able to make his connection with Alfredo Valentine, aka BK Apologist. I confirmed his connection with Nefaniti who is no longer associated with this hate group. I also confirm his connection to the racist, John Mark Reiser, AKA Vocab Malone. Vocab Malone, and I am with my man today, Jay the producer, Jay the producer. Oh, I got another idea. Brother Jay, have you ever sang parodies before? You know, a parody, like a satire song? Have I ever sung one? Yeah, a parody. No, I've Where never no, I've never um I've never sung a parody, man. I'm not gonna put you on the spot right now, but check it out. I wrote a parody to something, bro. I think that this this thing's hilarious. I'm gonna see if, if you're down to do it, and I'm gonna make a video <laughs> out of this joint. You know that song by Miley Cyrus, Party in the USA? Yeah. Yo, slavery in the USA, bro. Oh man. I got a whole I got a whole <laughs> song, man. And I can't yeah, sing. About that one off, All right. <laughs> Well, just uh, call him an Edomite, a cracker. Oh, he's black. Call, oh, call him a coon. Call, call him a coon. Works every time. Call him a coon. Call him a coon. Call him a coon. Call him a coon. As you can see, he's also connected with Damon Richardson of Urban Logia Ministries, whom I refer to as the educated rapper of the UA community. I don't think he's ever used a word that's less than five syllables. Also listed is Mike Pereira, AKA faithful to a God. I want to be clear, there is nothing these guys will not do for the sake of upholding their lies and hatred, even if it means to bully professors and contacting their workplace with the goal of silencing them. Before I share the latest incident, I want to share another email that was sent to Professor Bunis that was not shared in the previous video. This email was sent from Daniel Jones. Shalom and good evening, sir. I do not wish to take up much time. I would just like to confirm that what is being said in this YouTube video is indeed your response. It is being translated in conversation that you indeed confirm the script on the pews of the First African Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia is Solatrio. I did not personally gather that as your response from what was shown in the video. I also noticed Israel written in Aramaic block script and not in Solitrio script in your alleged response. So I felt it best to ask you directly if any of this is true. And if so, what was your take on what may or may not be on the pews? Thank you for your time. Shalom. Is this why Professor Bunis sent Pastor Major William Brown the following email? Is this why Professor Bunis sent Pastor William Brown? Possibly the name of Israel can be seen on the pews Benaya Israel assessed. The email says, thanks for this new look at the characters. Looking at it, that says it seems to me that you can also see Israel. That is 
Israel. Best wishes, David. Based on the images of the pews, Benaiah Israel assessed, Daniel saw Israel written in Aramaic block script. Professor Bunis shared the same thoughts to Pastor William Brown, but with one distinction. He did not make any reference to Aramaic block script. Now let's deal with another incident. The shifting of Professor Richard Katz. I want to begin with reading the last email Professor Richard Katz sent Pastor William Brown. Like Professor David Bunis, Professor William Katz sent a blind copy of the email to Pastor William Brown. Now pay close attention. The email says, Greetings, William. This week I received several emails inquiring about my conclusion regarding the pews. And I must be honest, many of those emails were not happy about it. In fact, last week I received an email from one particular individual asking for my credentials and place of employment in which I shared with them. I want to reiterate this hate group called the Urban Apologist contacted Professor Richard Katz place of employment. The email goes on to say, I received an email from one particular individual asking for my credentials and place of employment in which I shared with them and earlier this week I was informed by the university that someone emailed the administration stating that I was promoting and associating with a Hebrew Israelite hate group in the United States. I'm writing you to inform you and I wish you nothing but success on your journey in reference to the pews. But at this time, any translating of any future pews or projects I won't be involved in. See, this hate group contacted the university, Professor Richard Katz's workplace, and lied, stating that he, the professor, is associating with a Hebrew Israelite hate group. They lied, stating that Pastor William Brown is connected to a hate group called the Hebrew Israelites. I want you guys to understand the depth of hatred these guys are operating in. Really think about this for a minute. The biblical name or phrase Hebrew Israelite is now viewed as a term of hatred. The email goes on to say, I am writing to inform you and I wish you nothing but success on your journey in reference to the pews. But at this time, any translating of any future pews or projects I won't be involved in. In regards to the pews that you sent me, they are recorded and on record regarding Solitrio and Hebrew Square. I stand on my conclusion, but this email will no longer be accessible. What caused the shift? Why are we seeing a repeat of history? Who contacted the employers of Professor Katz? A major red flag in Professor Katz's response is this, stating I was promoting and associated with a Hebrew Israelite hate group. What, or should I say, who is the common denominator? The common denominator is Abdel Masi Amanhattani. I refer to Abu as the Alfred Hitchcock of the urban apologetic community. Because of his creepy greetings, he starts every video with, Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Greetings, 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 greetings. He contacted Professor Bunis in his attempt to play the role of good cop, bad cop. This method is similar to the Trojan malicious virus. The Trojan virus appears to be a harmless application until a specified date. It tricks computers and virus protection programs believing that it's not harmful to it. It then activates its compressed malicious applications and commands to take down that system. This is a very sick and demonic group of so-called Christians. This is Abdel Masi Aman Hatani initial email sent to Professor Richard Katz. Notice how he's probing or in the technology realm, it's called phishing. Are you Richard Katz? I recently saw a video about a professor named Richard Katz. 
who analyzed some pictures of markings on pews from Georgia and concluded that discernible Hebrew was found therein. If that was you, might I ask you some questions about that? Sincerely, AA. He is the common denominator. He is the common link between both professors. The good thing about this professor, he stood by his conclusion and did not waver. He made it clear to Abu and others from the urban apologetic community, all who reached out to him, that he stand firmly on his assessment of the pews. He says in his response to Abu, greetings, Mr. Abdel Masi Aman Hatani. Thank you for emailing me. Yes, I'm Professor Katz and I'm fully aware aware and very familiar with the video link you've attached concerning First African Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia, as well as other videos regarding this subject. I received several emails. Many were upset regarding my conclusion and findings of a discernible language on the pews in Georgia. Not to say that that's your position, but I feel it's best to share with you like I shared with others regarding my conclusion. And also due to my schedule and projects I'm involved in, I don't have the free time in my schedule. The red flag here that really stands out. Many were upset regarding my conclusion and findings of a discernible language on the pews. That is Abu's signature phrase discernible language. Abu's position on the pews shifted a number of times. Initially, he stated that there is a stronger case for Arabic being on the pews, then to a feast or famine or all or nothing approach. Either the writings are Arabic or not a discernible language on the pews. He shifted from asking for a discernible word to a discernible sentence or phrase. My response to him, you are an amateur and you are part of a hate group. Who are the many that Professor Katz is referring to? Why are so many upset about Professor Katz's position and conclusion about the pews? The email goes on to say, to go into full details regarding the breakdown and process, let me start with saying this, and I hope this answers your question. To go into full details regarding the breakdown and process, let me start with saying this, and I hope this answers your questions. William Brown didn't misrepresent or misquote my findings of a discernible language on the pews. In fact, upon his request, I gave him permission to share my conclusion regarding the pews. Professor Katz made it clear to Abu that he's given the same response to others, which includes those who are upset about his conclusion that Moray William Brown did not misrepresent or misquote his findings of a discernible language on the pews. The professor also made it clear that he gave Pastor William Brown permission to share his conclusion regarding the pews. His email goes on to say, my expertise brought me to the conclusion that Sola Trio and Hebrew black letters are on the pews based on several high resolution images of the pews that were sent to me by William Brown. Best wishes. Best wishes. Best wishes. Best wishes. The soldiers against each other. Divide the soldiers against each other. And there's a whole revolutionary principle that says that a revolution comes when two people get together and begin to conspire. You can never have a revolution on insurrection on earth as long as you drive a wedge between the first two people. You drive a wedge between the first two people, you'll never have a revolt. And in Korea, we never had the revolt. Secondly, people can only organize if they get together. But see what the, what the communists did, they started an information system, a squealing system, an informing system. And what we found in Korea was they had the most massive, widespread information system ever on earth, where people were recognizing other people or identifying other people who were planning on escaping. And what the communists were doing was telling people, look, you all got a responsibility now as a prisoner. If you hear about another prisoner talking about escaping, it's your responsibility to inform on him and tell on him. And if you do that, we'll reward you. You get an extra candy bar and apple. And once that happens, you see pretty soon, the soldiers didn't know who to trust anymore. They didn't know who to tell anything to. If he was planning on escaping, who did he tell? He didn't know what the other guy was gonna turn him in for a reward. And so 
The organization broke down, black and they quit communicating and sharing information with each other. Because all of a sudden you were planning on an escape. Next day someone drags you out in the cold, strips you down and pours ice water on you at a 26 below zero. Because somebody just turned you in for an apple and a piece of candy. And see, that's what happened in Meritorious Manumission in 1710, when blacks are being rewarded for turning in other blacks. Wait, that don't sound right. Just wait one second, that don't sound right. That don't sound right. Now, I'll explain why I wanted to dedicate this second section of the video to Faithful to God. Uh, about a week ago, Faithful made a suggestion which initially struck me as crazy, and at the time he suggested it, I flatly told him that I found it too far-fetched to take seriously. In short, I rejected his suggestion out of hand. So what was Faithful's crazy idea? Well, he asked me this question, what if the scholar Richard Katz doesn't actually exist? Is it possible that William Brown himself composed those emails and which he attributed to a fictional professor of Hebrew linguistics at Tel Aviv University? At the time, I immediately told them that of course not. Of course, that's not the case. They would never do that. You know, it, it, was, it seemed like a ridiculous assertion. However, over time, my receptiveness to the idea has evolved. And so in this section, I'd like to slowly go over the steps via which both our thoughts on this topic has evolved. Uh, at first, the things being pointed out will seem minor, but the case begins to build and mount as we go along. Notice the three dots at the top right corner of the email. As a feature on Gmail, if you click on those dots, you get a drop down menu, and among the options in that menu is one which reads Show Original. When you click on that, you receive more data about the email. And this is the data for the email that William Brown sent me on December 3rd. Feel free to pause the video and look it over. Now, here's the email which Richard Katz sent me on December 16th, so 13 days later. Once again, I can click the three dots at the top right corner and get the drop down menu and choose the option which reads Show Original. And here's the relevant data for the email which Katz sent me. Now, we can put the two results side by side for a comparison. First, note the SPF IPs are identical. Now, as this is part of a, a sender policy framework, the relevant IP address reflects that both messages were sent via Yahoo. It pertains to a Yahoo server, one of many Yahoo servers. However, it is highly unlikely that two people in different continents would wind up with the exact same IP across all four sets of numbers. I checked the, SP, the SPF IP for various other emails I received from Yahoo accounts and none of them matched like that. None of them were exact in the way these two are. I also sent an email to myself from a Yahoo account and found that my own SPF IP changes, for example, when I send it from my phone using my home Wi-Fi and when I alternatively send it using my mobile data instead, 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 instead. All jokes aside, you guys know I enjoy adding a little humor to my videos. This video was supposed to end here, but with the current events, I decided to extend it. Before I get into the meat and potatoes of the second part of this video, I want to turn your attention to 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 17 through 21. It says, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? In other words, the troublemaker? And he, Elijah, answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house and that ye have forsaken the commandments of Yahweh, and thou hast followed Baalim, in other words, the scam artist, and the atheist Garfield Reed, the racist Calvinist John Mark Reiser, aka Vocab Malone, the supposed Arab Roman Catholic Abdel Masi Amahatani, and others. Now therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. In other words, eating foods sacrificed to idols such as swine. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. 
and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Let me say this again. How long halt ye between two opinions? If Yahweh be Elohim, some will say Elohim, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Any person who is teaching the word of the Most High, you are not called to straddle between the two opinions, or should I say be comfortable and being lukewarm. What made my heart drop reading this entire text is the last sentence. And the people answered him not a word. The people left the prophet Elijah out to hang dry. The prophet was labeled a troublemaker for doing the will of the father. I carry a number of labels that's synonymous to troublemaker. Currently, my label is the soft-spoken, angry, Hebrew, Christian pastor. Like the Dow situation and others I've had to deal with, I don't need a crowd to support me. I can stand firm by myself with the Most High leading the way. So again, this video was supposed to end here. However, after the latest videos released by Abdel Masi, Aman Hatani, and Mike Pereira, aka Faithful to a God, the discussion has gone into a very dangerous territory, spearheaded by these guys. This is why I made it clear that I did not want to have any discussions with anyone from the UA community because I saw where the group wanted to take the narrative to a year ago, starting with the first video they did about me and the pews. Notice how they have not dealt with any of my teachings and or the historical facts of me being an Israelite. Notice how they did not go into the full identity theft video in which the discussion about the pews was part of the discussion, but not the primary part of it, but historical documents proving and supporting what's been handed down for centuries within my family about who I am, an Israelite. They have been completely silent in regards to the slave database the teachings and lectures about the Jewish community as we know them, and even my teachings about the covenant. Notice how they never address the Black Lives Matter message I did four years ago in Richmond, Virginia, because they can't. The pews are part of the puzzle, but they are not the entire puzzle. I will not downplay the importance of them because of these manufactured pressures from any group. If the pews are not important, then why is all communities talking about them? So now, we are to believe that the First African Baptist Church writings on the pews are passages from the Quran? When does it end? We all have families and children depending on us. When does it end? Why did they feel the need to go into the deep waters of slander and character assassination with Pastor William Brown? Was it really necessary? These guys are promoting extreme assumptions that would not hold water in any court. Why did they feel the need to completely destroy a man's character all because the professor chose to remove himself from the discussion like Professor David Bunis did? Well, can you blame him? Put yourself in these professors' position. You receive threatening emails from complete strangers. Strangers who told you that the person you are trying to assist at no cost is supposedly part of a hate group. Let's revisit the email sent to Professor Bunis from an educator named Joseph Patterson. It says, I am Joseph Patterson and I am an educator at a local high school in Virginia. And I have a few of my former students who identify with such groups as the moderate Hebrew Israelites, who has used your name and credentials to deduce that since Hebrew language was written on the pews by black slaves, therefore, blacks who came by way of the transatlantic slave trade are the true Jews. Why is everyone, including some within the Hebrew Israelite community, forgetting about this educator's deceptive email? Why did this educator decide to inject things that had nothing to do with the discussion to this professor? 
Why did he feel the need to operate under the spirit of meritorious manumission? Do you actually think he was the only one from the urban apologetic community who sent emails to this professor? At least Joseph Patterson did not hide behind a fake name. Let's revisit key words in Professor David Bunis' final email to Pastor William Brown. Hi William, the aftermath of our correspondence is a bit amazing to me. It really shows just how much interest there is in the inscription and how people with all kinds of agendas seem to be trying to use what they read out of the inscriptions to their own advantage. This was not the sense I got when I first read your original email. Professor Bunis used the word aftermath, which indicates the overwhelming responses he received about the pews. He makes it clear in this email that he don't know who to trust. He made it clear by stating how people with all kinds of agendas seem to be trying to use what they read out of the inscription to their own advantage. Abdel Masi Amanhattani is clearly wrong in his deceptive videos in suggesting that this professor's comments were directed only at Pastor William Brown. His message was directed towards everyone who reached out to him and that includes you, Abdel Masi Amanhattani, yet many of you want to question the integrity of Pastor William Brown. Abdel Masi Amanhattani and Mike Guerrero, as well as the rest of the UA community, have some of our people behaving in the spirit of a lynch mob. So moving forward, anyone in IT can pick apart their assumption within minutes. There's a difference between an actual court proceeding versus the court of public opinions. So who is Richard Katz? Did Pastor William Brown create this person? Is he simply an image of his imagination? We will answer this question shortly. But first, I want to walk you through a few things for you to consider. Let's start with understanding the meaning of Professor Richard Katz's name. Starting with his first name, Richard. It means brave, power, derived from the Germanic element, Rick. In other words, it means power, rule, and hard. In other words, bravery, hardy. The Normans introduced this name to Britain, and it has been very common there since that time. The name Katz, derived from the Hebrew words Kohen Zedek, meaning priest of justice, indicating a descendant of Aaron. And as you see, the usage is Jewish. Does Pastor William Brown know enough Hebrew to strategically select the name Katz? Did he know the origin of this word? Did he know that the word means priest or justice? Are there any indicators of his teachings that would suggest that he created this supposed fictional character? Now let's delve into the email starting with the created at line. The first highlighted line tells us the date the email was created and sent. The create at line on the left is Pastor William Brown's mobile phone and the left is Professor William Katz's mobile phone. We see that there is a gap of 13 days. On the left is the email Pastor Brown sent to Professor Bunis. And the one on the right is the message Professor Katz allegedly sent to Abdel Masi Amanhattani. So let's go to the from section. This section tells you that both users have Yahoo accounts. Both users use Yahoo email mobile application for Android phones. So this indicates that they use Android phones and have the same model. So is it unusual for this particular box to read almost identical? According to Statista.com, Android controls 72% of the mobile markets worldwide and 51.1% of the mobile market share within the United States. So this is not a red flag, but according to Abdel Masi, Amanhattani, and Mike Pereira, aka Faithful to Agod, the red flag is the same IP address. As many have stated, IPs don't lie. But my response? You are absolutely correct, but people do. Why does both phones have the same IP address? Is this truly a gotcha moment? 
Is this proof the owner of these accounts is Pastor William Brown? The simple response, emphatically no. However, I can't just end here. Let me explain what this line means. So what is a sender policy framework? In other words, SPF. Let me go into geek mode and explain what it is. This is what Cisco says about SPF. It says sender policy framework. In other words, SPF is a simple email validation system designed to detect email spoofing by providing a mechanism to allow receiving email exchangers to check the incoming mail from a domain is being sent from a host authorized by that domain's administrators. The list of authorized sending hosts for a domain is published in the domain name system, in other words, DNS records for that domain in the form of a specially formatted text record. Email spam and phishing often use forged sender addresses, so publishing and checking SPF records can be considered anti-spam techniques. This simply tells you that the SPF is a DNS server. This means that the SPF ID IP address is simply an IP address of the DNS server of the sending company. But I can't just stop here. Let me further explain. Starting with explaining an internet protocol address or simply put an IP address. So what is an IP address? An IP address is an address used in order to uniquely identify a device on an IP network. The IP address is made up of 32 binary bits, which can be divisible into a network portion and host portion of the help of a subnet mask. The 32 binary bits are broken into four octets. Each octet is converted to decimal and separated by a period, in other words, a dot. For this reason, an IP address is said to be expressed in dotted decimal format. For example, 172.16.81.100. The value in each octic range from 0 to 255. Now what you see on your screen is the IP address that these guys made a big deal of. As you see here, the first octic indicates the class of the IP address, which is 74. And when we look at the first two octics together, the first two octics reveal the network portion of the IP address. And the third and fourth octics reveals the host portion of the IP address. Simply put, SPNs are assigned to servers, not cell phones and other devices. So who owns this IP address? Who owns IP 74.6.131.124? Let's go to lookip.net and see what's revealed here. It says under the network range, we see a range of IP addresses, 74.6.0.0 to 74.6.255.255. Then we see net name and we see Inktomi. And when we go further down, we see organization, Inktomi Corporation. And then when we go down to the org name, or should I say the organization name, we see Inktomi Corporation. So Inktomi Corporation is simply an internet service provider, in other words, an ISP to the IP address 74.6.131.124. Inktomi Corporation is an internet service provider, in other words, an ISP. The IP range that I mentioned, 74.6.0.0, to the IP address 74.6.255.255 network, they are a service provider to that IP range. So who owns the IP address? Who owns 74.6.131.124? If you who are watching launch what is called the command prompt and type the following ping space www.yahoo.com you will see the following IP address 74.6.143.26. It is the DNS server that assigns a domain name to the IP address. Notice this IP address still falls within the scope of 
0.6.00 network. This is what Bloomberg says about Inktomi Corporation, which confirms what I just mentioned to you. Inktomi Corporation provides worldwide web searches services. The company provides a customizable private label solution that enables portals and destination sites to serve differentiated relevant search results. Inktomi operates in the state of California. So who owns the IP address 74.6.131.124? What devices, or should I say what device, is this IP address assigned to? I can say with complete confidence, the IP address is not owned by William Brown, nor is it owned by his cell phone provider. It is not owned by Professor Richard Katz. It is not owned by Professor Richard Katz's cell phone provider. This IP address is owned by Yahoo. Here's further proof. Here, you can find all lookup results for public IP address 74.6.131.124 owned by Yahoo. This includes the type of address, DNS lookup information, ISP, and location details. At the bottom of the page, you can find more functions like a detailed location map, abuse report, who is information, and an email server blacklist checklist. So again, I want to reiterate a key point in what I just read, like a detailed location map and abuse report. At the bottom of the page listed, if you click on the mail server blacklist check link, it will give you a list of sites that have made attempts to abuse or engage in spamming this IP address. You will not see Pastor William Brown's phone number or home address listed. So let's go to another site and see if Pastor William Brown is listed here for abusing this IP address. As you see, Pastor William Brown is not listed on this abuse report. So again, what Abdel Masi, Aman Hatani, and Mike Pereira, aka Faithful to a God, demonstrated in their videos is the attempt to destroy Pastor William Brown and Professor Richard Katz's character in the court of public opinion. They took advantage of all of you who are watching your lack of knowledge of this area of technology. So ask yourself, was this necessary? Is it worth it? Now let me give you more understanding on the SPF IP address. So is it possible for two different phones to have the same SPF? The answer is no. Again, the SPF is not assigned to any private devices. It's assigned to Yahoo's servers. So a more accurate question would be, is it possible for multiple emails sent by different cell phones or other devices have the same SPF? The answer is yes. Let me explain. A company can have two to three DNS servers within a single domain. Companies like Google, Yahoo, Microsoft have multiple server farms and far more than two or three DNS servers. To the Microsoft geeks out there, I'm sure you understand what I am going to share about domains. Understand, a company can have multiple domains within a forest. Each domain can represent a region. Every domain contains servers, workstations, user accounts, organizational units, in other words, OUs, group policies, in other words, GPOs, and etc. This would increase the need to distribute the DNS lookup load across multiple servers. The internet and email service providers would need to have multiple server farms and DNS servers in order to provide email services to millions of people. Yahoo has 225 million active users per month, which means 225 million active users per month has access to the same SPF, which I am confident that Yahoo has multiple server farms and DNS servers based on regions and countries. So depending on your region, the country you reside in will determine what SPF servers are available to you. Let's prove that there is a difference between the IP address assigned to your phone and the SPF IP address in Gmail. I want to show you how to access the SPF number with your Gmail account. I am confident if you are in the Southeast region, for example, where I reside, or your cell phone is serviced, 
you will get the same SPF servers providing service to you. So I decided to do a test. I created a Yahoo account. I installed the app to my cell phone and sent multiple emails to my Gmail account. Watch as I give a few examples. I checked the, SP, the SPF IP for various other emails I received from Yahoo accounts and none of them matched like that. None of them were exact in the way these two are. I also sent an email to myself from a Yahoo account and found that my own SPF IP changes, for example, when I send it from my phone using my home Wi-Fi and when I alternatively send it using my mobile data instead. It's not impossible for these two people to have the same SPF IP, but as I said, it's highly unlikely, highly unlikely, highly unlikely, highly unlikely. Abdel Masi Amanhatani is completely wrong and I will prove it to you. In this next example, I had someone from the same region send me five test emails from their Yahoo account and notice it only took three emails to see the same SPF IP address. Each email was sent within a three minute window. Notice you will see the same SPF IP that was in Pastor William Brown's email sent to Professor Bunis. Also, it's the same SPF IP attached to the email Professor Richard Katz supposedly sent to Abdel Masi Amanhatani. See, Abdel Masi Amanhatani continued to prove that he is the master of wild assumptions and speculations. He's proven over and over again to be just as reckless as the others in the urban apologetic community. Sooner or later, their viral behavior will eventually cost someone their life. Birds of the same feather flock together. Flock together. How do I find the actual IP address assigned to my phone? Now let me show you how to get to the IP address assigned to your phone. I'm going to use my phone as an example. Now if you have an Android phone, we have to go to the settings. If you have an iPhone, you have to go to your settings. But this example is based off of the Android phone that I have. Start by clicking on the settings icon. Scroll down to the about phone, then click status. Notice the IP address. My phone is assigned the IP address 10.238.0.0. Now, of course, I blurred out the last two octaves. My cell phone is in the 10.238.0.0 private network within AT&T. I proved that this so-called gotcha moment is fabricated. Fabricated. Whites found that out immediately, they changed the Virginia seal and said, get rid of that seal fast. And put up guards around the Capitol to make sure it didn't happen again. And that was in, that was in 1800. By 1821, another black named V.C. got equally as concerned. He had heard about it, he said, he's gonna try it in South Carolina. 
by another revolt. But VC says up front, VC organized his group. He walked around, he was a free black. He got free because he bought his own, paid, his, paid $600 and freed himself. He won money in a lottery. But he's very upset because he couldn't buy his children out of slavery. So VC would walk through the town in, in, in Charleston, South Carolina, telling black folk, get that hump out of your back. Straighten up, be respectful, take care of your own people, look out for your own people, quit trying to worry about everybody, look out for yourselves. And VC was very, he was a big man too, a big broad man. He said, I'll break your back if I catch you bending over. And he planned an insurrection. He called something like about three to 500 together to take over Charleston, South Carolina. But he told him up front, he said, let me tell you all something. He says, if I catch one black in this group trying to get meritorious manumission, he said, I'm gonna snap your neck like a twig. And he planned to revolt. And unfortunately, again, two days before his revolt was supposed to occur, not only was he squealed on once, he was squealed on twice. Wait, down sound right. Shalom family, this is Pastor Majors, uh, also known as uh, William Brown or Maury William Brown. I want to come to you just to speak with you briefly. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important uh, that I say these things. Uh, just over the, the past uh, week, uh, dealing with the accusations um, regarding the situation. Uh, I can see why the first Professor Bunis didn't want to be a part of this. Um, I can see why Professor Katz wouldn't want to be a part of this uh, because of the things that I'm even encountering going through at this moment. Um, but, you know, I'm strong. Um, I've done a great job, I feel, through the power uh, of the Most High God um, of establishing a credible relationship establishing in a, a, a level of integrity with my character between the Israelite community and the Christian community. Um, I think that that a testimony in itself, uh, I couldn't have did that by myself. Um, and it's just with the strong support of my family, my wife, uh, my Boom Church family, and things like that. Um, just looking at everything and, re and just thinking about everything. I've been running, running hard, just tr really trying to uh, push uh, unity between both sides. But the only thing I'm guilty of is is saying that I'm an Israelite. And so by me saying that I'm an Israelite, I was guilty from day one uh, and whatnot. So at the end of the day, I think that it's, it's best for me to fall back from both communities uh, and step back and just look at everything and make sure um, to stay focused. Um, and I want to encourage all of you guys to stay focused um, continue to build, continue to do the things that you're doing um, and, and support, uh, look at everything. Um, it's sad that, you know, people don't have a, a minimal understanding of technology and how things work uh, with IP addresses and how they change, uh, how model numbers are the same with every, with every model of type of that phone. If there's a Galaxy model, it, all of them have a model number for a million people. Um, bought a Galaxy 8 or a Galaxy 10 or whatnot, a million people would have the same model number uh, and things like that. And so I hope that this, this lesson or this video uh, that Pastor Kelly has presented to you, I hope it gives you understanding about technology and how technology works uh, so that way this doesn't happen again and people can be educated and look at it uh, from an educated perspective. Um, I don't want anybody to be ignorant of anything. And sometimes these situations, uh, it can be a moment where it seems as though uh, it looks one way, but when you get into the technology side of the accusations, it's not that. Shalom to you all. Um, and I just stand on, you know, let y'all be the truth and every man a liar. Shalom. And every man a liar. Shalom. And every man a liar. Shalom.